I have told myself for years, I must be able to write a screenplay. I, I must be. I'm so clever. I, I, how could I not? <laughs> but I never seem to actually do it. And I, I there's a distinct possibility that if I tried, I would fail. Welcome to Hugh Grant and Mark Lawrence. I'm going to ask a, a few questions about the film that we have just enjoyed, the rewrite, and then a little bit about their careers, and we will leave time for a few questions from the audience afterwards. I'm going to start with a question for Mark Lawrence, who wrote and directed this uh, film, The Rewrite. Did you, in fact, write the script specifically for Hugh Grant? And um, if so, once you enter the picture, I'm curious about any changes that might have been made, because to me, this is one of the more beautifully natural performances that I've seen lately. But we'll start with you. Um, Hugh was, I'd say, the eighth or ninth choice. <laughs> <laughs> for the part. We'd even tried some women. I was willing to try. No, this, this was one um, I had definitely, I think I called you about, told you the idea. But Hugh is very script-centric, so we have no standing arrangement, even though we've done a bunch of films together. He, uh, in my experience, is uh, sadly unswayed by personal relationships or money or... Um, loyalty. Loyalty or <laughs> decency or yeah. any... Um, so it's really just about the script. So, yeah. of course, it was... Uh, once I mentioned the idea to Hugh, if he had said, I hate that and there's no way I'm even going to read that, then I wouldn't have uh, written it for him. But once he said he had some interest, then uh, went and wrote the script and then sent it to him. And I remember being terrified, having said I like the idea. I thought, well, what if the script's crap? Then that, how do I say no to but my old chum Mark? But you've done that even, even from the very first one that we did together. Yeah, my philosophy is just to do them anyway, even if they are crap. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and um, I'm sorry, Annette, the second part of the question was... Uh, well, once you came into the film, because the, it's called the rewrite, so I guess I'm allowed to ask this, was it pretty much the script that you read, that you in fact shot and that we're seeing? Or, and this is partly because everything you do seems so natural. I mean, you know, the timing seems to be so effortless, though I'm positive that it's not, and I want to ask you about that. Um, but were there some changes made because you felt that the character would say this and not that, the throwing away of lines? Well, uh, in terms of whether I could say all the lines, uh, not a single thing has to be changed. There's some weird um, witchcraft that goes on with Mark. Um, he's not quite like other men <laughs> in that he completely can channel uh, sort of characters that are perfect for me. So there's not a single line where I wince or think, oh, we've got to massage that. Um, but having said that, because Mark is one of the most neurotic people I've ever met, <laughs> and I'm maybe, you know, up there close to him, we, we, and there probably were many, many drafts between the, f the one that came to me and the one that we shot. Oh, yeah. No. How many? I'm curious. I honestly, it would be, I'd have to bring my computer in, but um, there's what counts as a draft, which is a complete overhaul of the thing, and then a scene that's not working. You know, we did a reading of the script in LA, and then a lot of changes came out of that. When Marissa came on board, she had some notes. There were studio people, there were, you know, all the normal things, and then the then the logistic things that happen during movies, you can't get a location you thought you were going to get. You have to write around that. So. But he'll do a whole new draft based on his 11-year-old son's opinion. <laughs> Those, well, <laughs> Linus Lawrence right there is my most feared All critic. Right. Now, um, <laughs> Linus, is, Linus is 11 and uh, devastating in terms of his criticism. And the first time we screened the movie for an audience, not unlike you folks in, in New York downtown, 
he brought up something that no one had seen in the entire process, which was a, a, a very major flaw which need, needed to be fixed. So, and then he would come to editing and fill little notebooks. Um, and you sit behind uh, the editor. So. Whenever you want to go to college, talk to me. Columbia University <laughs> will be interested. Uh, and in fact, even in the film, you acknowledge the importance of an 11-year-old boy, that it was the telling of the story to Alex that led to Paradise Misplaced. So. Some of that actually is Linus, because Linus is uh, interesting concerns about mortality and other things, so we've discussed that, so that is part of the Paradise Misplaced um, backstory. That's my daughter, Gracie, also, who is a Broadway actress and musician. And uh, last one I'll mention, uh, my wife, Linda, is here somewhere, or maybe she left, oh yes, yes. and uh, my parents, and uh, my, my <laughs> and my son, Clyde, who's 21, wrote the uh, score for the film and, and is performing it. It's completely possible that everyone in this hall is a family member of Mark. Right? <laughs> well, You've invited at, me to those evenings before. <laughs> at the 92nd Street Y, we think of ourselves as an extended family, so I'm very happy that you are here and that we welcome all of you. I'm curious about... Oh, my sister and Doris. Sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They drove in from New Jersey, so that alone, I think, probably warrants a standing ovation. So. <laughs> Now, I'm curious about an aspect that, because I've really been enjoying Two Weeks Notice, which I recently saw in Music and Lyrics, and in each one, you play a character who at the beginning doesn't demand very much of himself, you know, even when it's a real estate mogul in, in uh, Two Weeks Notice, somebody who's kind of well, morally lazy and a bit complacent and takes everything for granted. And I love the beginning of Music and Lyrics where you play Alex, a former star, um, pop star who is asked to be in battle of the 80s has-beens um, and you actually say at the beginning that you no longer have to do anything you know this is another case where somebody at the beginning is kind of coasting on his former glory and has to come back and prove himself do you what kind of feeling do you have revisiting that kind of a character with Mark well, it's a mixed feeling because, on the one hand, I do, I do quite like the whole comedy of failure. I don't know why. Um, on the other hand, I suppose there was a slight anxiety that we were retreading uh, the has-been territory. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we just did. Yeah, we did, absolutely. <laughs> well, but maybe that territory is, is quite fertile for people certainly of a certain age. I mean, you know, it's one thing when we're in our 20s and another in our 40s or later. And I think in each case, though, you play somebody who is very true to the profession. What, I mean, you were amazing as a singer, by the way, in, in music and lyrics. I was very impressed. And in two weeks' notice, you have the wonderful degree of auteur and you know, haughtiness uh, as, as the real estate mogul. But I found you absolutely persuasive as the screenwriter here, partly because of the way that you handle words in the classroom and throughout the film. And I was wondering how much of that is your natural comic timing? How much is rehearsal? How much was improvisation in terms of the way you work together? None of it can be rehearsal because we didn't rehearse. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah that, that, would, that so would be we're, nice. we're not we're not big rehearsers. Okay, uh, I don't. That we, there is a um, a happy accident in that I am not very good. Uh, with the scenes that you're supposed to be good at in films, which is the one where there's no words, where you're just, the camera closes in on you, you know, like Juliette Binoche in Bleu. <laughs> um, we were talking backstage about Kishlovsky. I'm sorry, we share a passion for that director. Well, I often watch that, you know, moments like that and just think that is so many thousands of miles away anything I could, from anything I could do. But, you know, the little bit I can do is with words, is with, with uh, lines and... Um, He's a, uh, Mark's very literary, you know, um, well, he's a wordaholic. There's too many <laughs> words in his films. So actually we share the same fault. Yeah. Yeah, no, that we were ta when we were talking about, um, you know, different actors approach scenes so differently, we were talking about Sandy, 
mm. and uh, Sandy Bullock. And when Sandy walks onto a set and is sizing up a scene, she's immediately registering things in a very visual sense. I can trip over that clock, and then I can fall on top of that guy. And it's a great, brilliant physical yeah. um, comedy sense. I've made the mistake of trying to force you to do a couple of physical things <laughs> in um, films, it's, which you're yeah, still very just unhappy. getting over, I yes, think, yeah. from... I think the whole soon. crew is still getting over the embarrassment. Yeah, there were yeah. a couple. Yeah. Although in music and lyrics, you had to really dance, which... Yes. <laughs> and obviously, Richard Curtis made you dance. Yes. So. yes. But we really enjoyed that dance at the end of Love Actually. I think there was a consensus there. I wouldn't be quite so self-deprecating about your physicality or your ability to register something without the verbal part. Because even when you call Alex in the film, and even though I know that that is a verbal conversation, it's just you and the phone. It's not another person you're reacting to. And I, I could see in the face. I mean, you know, there was a great, forgive me if I put it this way, but I think that when you were younger, you were in a way almost too beautiful for the physical scenes to work. No, I'm, I'm being absolutely honest. You know, I would watch a Hugh Grant film and I would look for that, you know. And now I see the actor and there's so much more that I think you're able to express by virtue of having lived more. I'm just saying it as I see it. I'm going to try and pluck the positive out of it. <laughs> I believe that everything I'm saying is positive because I think you're a better actor now. Yeah, yeah, obviously that's what you're going for. I, <laughs> I get it. Yeah, and thank you very much. I don't think any of us just want to be pretty all our lives, do no, we? No, no, no. Well, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try a new tack now. I'm yeah. going to ask Mark Lawrence. I, seriously, I do want to know about this. You were yourself, I gather, an English major at the University of Binghamton, right? So this is a return to your turf. And uh, there's such a sharp observation of campus life in the rewrite. Um, even though I know some of it might have been drawing on your memories, I assume that you had to do a little bit of research to get that pulse of what campuses are like today. Because frankly, I consider the campus life very different from 1981, and I do remember that. Um, could you talk a little about the shaping of this story based on your experiences there? Um, I mean, I, I generally try not to write anything that requires research because I'm very lazy. So um, I can't think of any movie. I guess I did this, wrote this movie, Miss Congeniality, was the most research I ever had to do because I had to go to a beauty pageant. Um, um, but for... <laughs> That's unimaginable. <laughs> Um, what yes. face did you make? No, uh, no one mistook me for a contestant, <laughs> if you're concerned about it. Um, um, but for this movie, I would say my son, Clyde, who wrote the music, is in college. And so I get to see a lot of him and a lot of him on campus at his school and uh, here and hanging out with a lot of his friends and contemporaries. And Gracie is a senior in high school. so. There is some language I try to approximate in the film that I hear like the phrase, uh, a lot I'm down with something, is something that's apparently come back. Um, word has become a kind of response to, or at least I hear that from my son. So yeah, I think it was being up at his school watching, because I don't get back to Binghamton very much, and listening to my, to my kids talk, eavesdropping on those conversations. Okay. <laughs> and I assume that for you it was not necessary to do any research about college life because you're the fish out of water when you get to Binghamton. For you, though, I'm curious. <laughs> right? Maybe he did. He may have done I a lot don't know. of research. Did you? I felt it was important to hang out with some young students. <laughs> <laughs> and you chose them off Facebook. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, research is research. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm more interested in from your perspective <laughs> is the depiction of Hollywood. Because when I first was watching the film, I wasn't sure how much of that was meant to be caricature and how much is a pretty authentic depiction of contemporary Hollywood dealings with pitches. Well, Mark would know more about that than me. But I mean, uh, my experience is you, you cannot caricature Hollywood. It's uncaricaturable. <laughs> um, and certainly, you know, I mean, that. Jason Antoon, who's the studio executive in this, does a pretty brilliant job of 
And you cast in quite a few of your films. Yeah, I love Jason. He's wonderful. But I would actually say that that was a very (laughs) subtle, dignified, gentle portrait of Hollywood, Um, (laughs) honestly, in in, in the film. But I think the thing that is alive is the, uh, the very sort of sweet lying that goes on. Um, and everyone sort of has to yeah, just, yeah. I know they're lying to me right now, and I guess I'll lie back to them and say thank you, and I know they're, you know, that's just, I would say, oxygen out there, <laughs> you know, um, so. Mm. And do you live out there, is that? God, no, no. Um, <laughs> the we, last we, time he went there, he got beaten to a jelly. Oh, that's right, yeah. No, the last, just before we shot two music, weeks No, music and lyrics, I was, oh, yeah. I was, uh, um, Yes, assaulted at gunpoint in L.A., which is, which is a, basically a metaphor for my Awful, entire time. It still time makes now. me laugh, because that, there's nothing funny about being assaulted at gunpoint. <laughs> no, I, I get it. Um, I, I, and, and they it's thought it was funny. because it's your worst fears. It's everything I don't yeah, like, is yeah. being assaulted and being in L.A., yeah. And, and <laughs> so it was... It was uh, I lived there for... Um, 10 years, I guess, when we were Family Ties, which was shot out there, which, and, and, then, and then stayed um, for a period of time. And now I, I only go back if I have to or want to be assaulted. Yeah, so, yeah. And you're an East Coast guy. Yeah, well, Are, I'm from New York, yeah, Brooklyn and Long Island. It's yeah. much narrower than that. He's not <laughs> yeah. just East Coast. He's Upper West Side, and it must be weird for you to be on the East Side. This is, right? I'm not, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know whether I needed shots for yeah, this yeah. to come over here. Um, my, yeah, my kids go to yeah. school around here, so I do come over occasionally. But I, I generally, I don't like leaving the apartment. So. OK. <laughs> Good. But actually, two weeks notice had a lot in Coney Island. Was the, are you originally from Brooklyn? Yeah, and, and music and lyrics was shot in my building. I mean, to me, that's, that's really good writing. Um, <laughs> that's, I think um, it's really close to Shakespearean, when you can take the elevator to the lobby and shoot a scene, um, that's as good as it gets, I think. Okay. Um, and a question for, for Hugh Grant. Having played this screenwriter, who becomes actually a pretty good teacher, did, um, did this incite in you any desire to either try writing a screenplay or teaching? In other words, is it sometimes that when you play this kind of a part and it fits that you get um, a feeling to try it? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, no, uh, not really. I mean, I, I have told myself for years, I must be able to write a screenplay. I, I must be. I'm so clever. I, I, how could I not? <laughs> but I never seem to actually do it. And I, I, there's a distinct possibility that if I tried, I would fail. Um, and teaching, teaching doesn't have sufficient uh, ego trip for me, I think. I, um, I like a lot of attention. <laughs> Although there is some, I mean, there is some. I did once, I got persuaded when drunk to do a, a, a master class in acting. I mean, the idea is absurd from me. But I went and I did this thing and uh, I did quite enjoy it. Perhaps largely because of the young studentesses. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know that there's a big difference between acting and teaching. On the other hand, when Michael Caine was our guest here a few years ago, I mean, he he actually has done these tapes where you can see what a wonderful teacher he is imparting so much of what he has experienced and and passing it on. And occasionally, uh, to be blunt about it, when I'm lecturing at Columbia, I mean, we still get an ego trip out of it too. I mean, it's not that vast a leap from being on a stage, a sound stage or yeah, a theater yeah. stage, and being in front of a large hall where you get to impart what you really want to to a group of people. So not that fast, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Particularly when it's a subject which lots of young people, for some reason, are very fascinated by. I mean, it'd be much more challenging if it was geology. This is true. Yeah. I wouldn't know how to teach anything but film, no. yeah. <laughs> um, Mark, a question about casting, because I believe that Hugh Grant anchors what is a marvelous, marvelously performed film by, by everyone. I have been a true admirer of Marissa Tomei for many, many years, and I was so glad to see her doing a lead part, because lately she's been superb in secondary roles. And if you could just talk a little about how once she was cast, I mean, just, you know, was that the role? You, I know you didn't write it for her, but what her essence brought to the film? 
I, I sort of did write it for her without her knowing. Um, okay. We, you know, I don't know if I had the discussions with you, but certainly the, the producers, uh, you know, the folks at Castle Rock, I, we would always say, God, well, it's, you know, Marissa Tomei would be the perfect person for the, yeah. for the part. So um, she's, you know, an unbelievably gifted actress, and she's a little intimidating, and she's very, um, I don't know if she's absolutely method, but she's sort of close to it. Um, so the, our first lunch together was terrifying because we met and, and everything was very cheerful. And, and then as soon as we brought out the script, she said, no, I don't know why you wanted me for this role. And then um, it got very scary. Um, but it, what's, what's great about it, she's super smart, and it's all about the performance. So as a, as a writer, it, it's helping you refine every moment. And as a director, she will you know, challenge you if a moment feels inauthentic. And I know people say this, but I, for me, the best moments on the set often are when somebody says, this doesn't work, or this doesn't feel right, or this isn't comfortable. Because if you've cast the movie correctly, I find that often actors know more about the part or uh, have a special insight into the part that, as the writer, you may not have. And if they're telling you anything from, this line doesn't make sense, or why would I sit here, you're crazy not to hear them out and think about it. Because if something feels wrong to them on, on two levels, number one, if something feels wrong to them, they're on camera, I'm not. So if they're not comfortable, whatever we wind up getting is not going to be comfortable or real. And secondly, maybe what they're telling you goes to something I've written incorrectly. That's usually what it is on my movie, because it's not lots of car chases and stuff. So it means something's wrong in the writing. So it's always an opportunity to go back and take a look at that. And one of the pleasures of being a writer-director is you can actually say, give me two minutes or give me five minutes, and you can go home <laughs> or, or try to rewrite the script. And you're saying that you did not rehearse, right? So that when you would be doing a scene with Marissa Tomei, basically you were just you know, starting without rehearsal. Were there many takes? Did you refine, for example, the rhythms of your interchanges? Because I, I particularly love the scenes when the two of you are sort of feeling out one another, you know, trying to understand getting to one another. And by the end of the film, I thought if these two, peop two people don't end up together, I I'll just be very upset because it was so beautifully modulated. Um, maybe... Well, you're very nice. I, I really like you, by no, the way. No, I, I, I'm um, honest. Uh, but, um, <laughs> the funny thing about um, Marissa uh, is that although she does do all this method bollocks, um, <laughs> which actually has made her one of the great actresses of her generation, without any question. She also actually has the, the other thing, the just easy facility with comedy. Uh, if you look at My Cousin Vinny, I mean, that is a great, great, it's just a brilliant comic performance. And um, so when we were doing scenes like, you know, when we first meet and she's running after me with that screenplay she's written, um, it's such a lovely, it's such a lovely feeling when you realize, oh, I see this person completely can do comedy rhythms and stuff like that. And it's, 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 it's a huge weight off your mind, because sometimes you, you meet people who are much better actors than you, but uh, comedy rhythm isn't their thing. Right, right, I understand. Mm. J.K. Simmons, also an Allison Janney. J.K. Simmons, everybody now knows what a great actor he is in terms of the whiplash, best supporting that he's been winning nonstop. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that you had not seen Whiplash, that that came after you shot it. this. Um, he talked to me about it while we shot. He sort of described it, but I hadn't seen it, yeah. Um, just a little about choosing him and Allison. Is it Janney or Janie? I'm never certain. Janney. Janney. Um, these are wonderfully familiar faces, whether from television or film. Um, just, just how you worked with them a little bit? I mean, they're the, you know, again, we were very lucky on this film because we got our first choice for every single role. Um, Allison was the, the dream for the part of that professor, and JK was the, similarly the dream for the head of the department. The only hesitation we had, and it's funny, we were going through the casting, and finally somebody pointed out that they had played husband and wife in, in Juno. Juno. Um, but, uh, which is a great movie, and they were both fantastic in it, but, uh, you know, they're such great actors, I thought, it, if everything else is working, no one's going to stop watching the film because of that. But, uh, 
incredibly easy to work with. Allison doesn't realize it, but I just kept going on takes just because I wanted to keep her there. It was such a fantastic experience. I thought she was, and, and the um, ratio of talent to insecurity is the best I've ever seen. She's just um, not at all confident about how incredibly great she is. So it couldn't have been a better experience, the nicest person in the world. And uh, J.K. similarly, I think, very easy. I wish I had interesting tales to talk about in terms of directing either of those folks, but it was always just modulations on a line or because we had it this way, why don't we try one this way or, or, or that kind of stuff. Um, sure. unless, unless you had uh, other experiences with them that I wasn't aware of. I didn't like them. No. <laughs> But that would go for almost everyone. So, um, no, they were yeah. brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. they're both great. And actually, I, mean, I, I do want to ask you, because you've worked with some of the world's great directors, um, in addition to Mark Lawrence. <clears throat> when I think back, I mean, Woody Allen with Small Time Crooks or Ang Lee, Sense and Sensibility. I mentioned earlier my affection for Tom Tickford and the Wachowskis, Cloud Atlas, Michael Apted, Ro Roman Polanski, when you did mm -hmm. Bitter Moon. Mm -hmm. um, Ken Russell, Lair of the White Worm. I mean, you've worked with some of the really great directors, some of whom we no longer talk about perhaps as, perhaps as much as 20 years ago. How is working with Mark Lawrence different? I'm, I'm just curious because this is a very American writer-director as opposed to, let's say, James Ivory, you know, who is American, but the scripts were Ruth Prover Jabvala, Ismail Merchant was very involved, as we know, in the productions. Could you just... Am I funnier than Roman Polanski or James Ivory? <laughs> He's pretty funny, actually. No. Right. no. <laughs> um, but the thing is, um, uh, for an actor, it's way more fun uh, to do a film with someone like Mark, uh, whose emphasis is... Um, maybe, maybe it's because you come from... Uh, you come from TV, he said, grandly. <laughs> Maybe because you began in television. And where the main imperative is actually, uh, you know, what, what some people might sneer at, ratings, which it really interprets and, and translates as pleasing people, making people laugh, keeping audiences watching so that advertisers pay more money. It's neat. I think that's an unbelievably solid and good discipline. Mm -hmm. And um, if you come from the completely other end of the spectrum in the whole world of film and uh, you go to European cinema, you might get the great geniuses like Kislovsky, but um, so many other people in that world have taken on the kind of grandeur of the auteur and uh, this is me, I, you know, this is, I am the great maestro of my film. And, um, and to a certain extent, someone like Polanski, of course, is a genius uh, or Ken Russell, but uh, it's a nightmare for the actors very often. I mean, um, you know, Mark said just now that when an actor says, oh, it's not really working for me, it doesn't feel right, he loves that and he changes it. I remember once saying to Ken Russell, <laughs> one afternoon after he'd had one of his, you know, very relaxed lunches, um, <laughs> I was doing a scene in which I had to cut a, a lady in half with a sword. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, it doesn't feel quite right, Ken. <laughs> And I remember his very sensitive acting note was, well, fuck how it fucking feels. Do it how I fucking showed you. Okay. <laughs> uh? <laughs> I didn't get all of that, but I'm going to use it on the next film. You know, so. No, and, and by the way, I hate to say it, but certainly in Hollywood and in New York, there are many who take themselves as the auteurs, too. It's not just in Europe. And it's refreshing to find people who just know how to write and tell a good story without feeling a film by has to be you know, placed above it's the a, It's a really crucial distinction between uh, people who, the, the, for whom the final product is for an audience and for whom the final product is for them. Yeah, uh, It right. really is huge. And, um, what he's saying is I'm a hack, but, um, but, I, but um, <laughs> I won't take the film by credit, actually. I have a problem with that credit. I've always thought it was just idiotic, and it was a creation of the Directors Guild, I think, to try to um, make themselves feel better about themselves. And when I 
I started in films, I, was, I had written movies that were getting made, and I was not the director, and I was on the set. But as, when I started directing, as a writer, I was offended by the film by credit. So um, I actually have to sort of sometimes petition the guild not to get it on, because the way it works, I think, is that on your second movie that you're directing, automatically, it will be a film by. So you have to kind of go in and, and try not to have that happen. But I've... Hmm. Um, I have great contempt for the Writers Guild and the way, <laughs> the, the, the way they've treated, treated him. What was it? Was it music and lyrics where what, what? you wrote every single draft, oh, like God. 40 drafts? Oh, don't take me back there. No, it was Miss Congeniality. But uh, the Writers Guild is, is, uh, is someone here like the president of the guild to just said before? <laughs> because, uh, and I, I have some friends here who are wonderful writers, and I don't know how they feel, but, but um, it's a, it's, it's a very dysfunctional organization, but, um, but the Directors Guild's much more organized, I think, but that film by credit, I always thought, was just, was just pompous and ridiculous. Okay, I, I understand that. I want to ask a question for um, Hugh Grant about some of the actors who inspired you, who may have shaped you. I know that many have likened you to your namesake, Cary Grant, because certainly you are one of the best exemplars of the contemporary kind of the timing, the charm, the versatility that he exhibited, especially in the 40s and 50s. Um, but I was thinking maybe someone like Rex Harrison or you know David Niven, are, are there other actors that you watched when you were younger that gave you some kind of inspiration? Um, well, I wish I had a good answer to that because I, of course, uh, didn't mean to be an actor, so I didn't ever, you know, watch films and think, I, I, I want to be an actor and I want to be like him. Uh, I fell into acting by mistake uh, at the age of 22, and I thought, I, I, I'd do this job for a year and earn some money, and then I had other plans, and it lasted 30 years. <laughs> but once I was in it, um, I did uh, take an interest in films, and, uh, but none of the, people, the actors that I admired uh, uh, were even remotely in the, uh, operating in the same genre of what I can do, not, not even remotely. I mean, they were people basically um, uh, killing people. It was Robert De Niro and Pacino and Duval and, wow. you know, uh, Marlon Brando. The, those were the great heroes. Although I did also have an obsession with um, Woody Allen, uh, especially in the sort of 80s and ni early 90s and... Uh, uh, yeah, a complete obsession. I used to dream about Woody Allen in a quite sinister way. <laughs> hmm. And then working with him, did you continue to dream or no? Um, well, yes, but that was more <laughs> nightmares about being fired because <laughs> you're so insecure in a Woody Allen film yeah. because, as you know, you, you don't know what's happening. You've only got your part. You don't even get the whole script and then there's no rehearsal, and there's actually no conversation. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, you just live in fear. <laughs> Understood. Well, Woody Allen sat in this chair a few years ago. We did an evening of his favorite American films and showed clips. And that leads me to ask Mark Lawrence about some of the shaping inspirations on your work. I mean, in watching your, your films, I keep feeling like you've channeled something out of the Frank Capra films and the screwball comedies. And I'll go one step further. I really, I haven't said this yet, I, I really admire your female characters. Um, I know that sometimes in romantic comedies, there are strong women, sometimes less strong, and the focus is still on the male. But when I saw Sandra Bullock's character in Two Weeks Notice, Drew Barrymore in Music and Lyrics, and tonight, Marissa Tomei in this film, you write women who are smart and ebullient and vulnerable and grounded and they have a moral compass. And they're funny. And they're very yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, and so I thought Howard Hawks maybe, you know, so mm. just uh, if you could tell us a little about that. Well, I'm very insecure in my masculinity, so it's very easy for me to, <laughs> to, to channel that, but I do remember that in two weeks notice um, when we were rehearsing, Sandy said at one point, oh, I get it, I'm you. So, um, so, uh, which I don't know if, yeah, so we had that kind of, I said, because sometimes it's easier actually for me to write about my own stuff and put it in, a, in another gender. Um, 
You seem confused <laughs> and hurt, and you were also amazed. So. Slightly revolted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't want to tell you before you did any of the yeah, romantic I, yeah. scenes, because then you would have felt like you were kissing me. It would have, yeah. yeah and, and we were having a hard enough time making those work just between you and Sandy. Yeah, so, no, yeah, that's, so. That's, so. Um, so I'm sorry, you know. The whole now. conversation's gone down a very yeah. disagreeable. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, sorry. Uh, directors, that, well, you know, I guess if I had to pick a couple, Billy Wilder is really, I guess, if, if I had to pick one, uh, you know, there's, there's no more humbling experience for me than going and watching The Apartment. Um, you, you feel like, well, there's just no point in trying. I mean, it's just, it's not going to get better than that. It can't get better than that. And, um, you know, what you were talking about before, Hugh, about auteur and that kind of, and I, I've, I've always felt that, you know, I think what Duke Ellington said about music, there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. So I think, that, you know, the distinctions people, there's one line in the film sort of about that and saying, why can't you like 101 Dalmatians and Reservoir Dogs? That's... It's kind of what I think, um, but the ability of someone like Wilder to be vastly entertaining and yet to be so smart and have everything be about character, and even the way he shot, there was never a wasted shot. I mean, you look at that film, every shot is about character and story. And so, you know, when we were up at Binghamton and people asked, you know, how do you, do you take screenwriting courses? What well, I, I never have and, and probably should, but, um, but to me, there's no better school than watching those kinds of films if you're interested in doing anything like it. I mean, I love the Woody Allen movies. I love you know, Jim Brooks. I mean, Broadcast News may be um, one of my favorite new movies of all time. Um, so it, it's a wide range of stuff. But if I had to pick one, it would probably be Wilder. Mm. It's interesting that you mentioned Wilder, given this previous conversation we just had. He had been writing screenplays in Hollywood for many years and partnered with Charles Brackett. Mm -hmm. And they were horrified by what they thought were mediocre directors taking their material and doing dubious things. So Wilder decided that he had to become a director and bracket a producer just so that they could exercise control over their screenplays. So what did Wilder do? He, he became, he, he asked Howard Hawks if he could stay on set mm -hmm. when they shot, um, oh, Barbara Stanwyck, Ball of Fire. Mm -hmm. And he said he wanted to learn how to direct and he watched Hawks and then he made, you know, his own first film. Mm -hmm. so, it, you have to protect your material. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he became the first director in Academy Award history, I think. He won with The Apartment Best Screenplay, Best Director, and Producer for The Apartment, which, you know, was like this extraordinary thing because he didn't even try to be an auteur. He just wanted to protect his material. He wanted to tell his story. But, you know, having said that we both know very well, um, there are writers who, uh, Bill Goldman, who were both... Um, good friends with Bill has no interest in directing, never did. Um, doesn't, I think, like actors that much. No, <laughs> hates them. Yeah, yeah. so. so uh, yeah, and, and to, to make it worse, I think he, I, I heard that once he gave a class at Columbia and apparently told the students that most of them would never make it. I mean, it was very much like <laughs> what you say in the film, and I, it was very depressing for the students <laughs> in the room. Sorry he's about he's that. not. He's wonderful, but um, but he's very honest and and uh, I, I, for my money, the greatest American screen, the greatest American non-directing screenwriter we've ever had. Yeah. Now you have worked with a particular actress who became a screenwriter, Emma Thompson, and I want to mention it because you've collaborated with her four times. Um, if if I if my notes are correct, the love interest in Sense and Sensibility, and we showed the clip from that. But you played her brother in Love Actually. Yes. She's also in Impromptu. Yes. Where you are Chopin and Remains of the Day, and she for me is uh, just a wonderful example of not only a great actor but also somebody who has been able to make that transition to screenwriting. Could you just tell us a little about working with her because you've done it a few times? Well. Um... She's, um, I mean, she is a brilliant actress, which I always find irritating. Um, <laughs> but she's, uh, as, a, as a screenwriter on Sense and Sensibility, um, she was remarkably protective of her text. I mean, you know, you couldn't change a, an and or a the. Uh, she'd come and pick you up on it. Um, but, you know, she did do a brilliant job. I, I personally think 
her script of Sense and Sensibility is better than the book, <laughs> um, which I think is slightly dreary. Yeah. And actually, speaking of which, did you make it a Jane Austen fight because of the fact that he had been in I did, and then I remember afterwards, is this going to be some strange Twilight Zone-ish surreal reality because you were in Sense and Sensibility uh, and then you were, but um, no one has, uh, you're the first person to bring it up. And every single journalist in the last 24 hours, yes. Oh, oh really? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? I guess I'm not the only one doing my homework, sorry. Um, but uh, by the way, you mentioned the Twilight Zone, and I, I did not know that Rod Serling was from Binghamton, and I consider him to be one of the greatest writers of the Absolutely. 20th century. Um, I was curious you know, where you got the, how did Paradise Misplaced, which I think is one of the most brilliant satiric titles I've heard in years, you know, it's almost like a Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> how did that come to you? Uh, Paradise Misplaced is actually the first screenplay I ever wrote. Um, I was on Family Ties and I wrote that screenplay and it was bought by um, I think Scott Rudin at 20th Century Fox and has still never been made. But I, um, but I liked the title so much. Um, the title was probably better than the script, um, but uh, that's, so I kind of resuscitated that for this. It finally came in handy. Well, I'll tell you the truth. When I started watching the film a few weeks ago, I enjoyed the film. I was with it. And as soon as I heard Paradise Misplaced, I laughed out loud, suddenly remembering my days as, as a PhD student in English at Yale, reading Paradise Lost, and just, I thought, okay, this, I'm now on the wavelength. I'm a happy person, <laughs> and I stayed with it. Um, before we take some questions from the audience, I read that for Hugh Grant, one of your next projects, it just intrigued me so much that I, I wanted to ask about it, Florence Foster Jenkins, to be directed by Stephen Frears, co-starring Meryl Streep, my favorite actor, um, as a New York heiress who wants, wanted to become a singer but can't really sing well. Could you just tell us if that's happening and what it is? No, it is happening. And um, we shoot it in May. And um, well, yeah, but you know, she's a real person who, who lives. So I gather, yeah. Here on the Upper East Side. Um, <laughs> And she was, uh, she was a millionaireess and uh, an heiress, and she sponsored lots of classical concerts. And she had this extraordinary kind of classical music group called the Verdi Club. And she was very much loved, but she had one eccentricity, which was that she felt that she herself could give coloratura opera performances. And she wasn't just bad, she was hilariously bad. And I mean, you can... You know, you put it in YouTube and it's still just the funniest thing you've ever heard in your life. But fascinatingly, she continued to believe that she was excellent, even though she could fill Carnegie Hall with people who were rocking with laughter. Um, so it's a, it is a comedy, but it's, it's laced with, with tragedy. Uh, and she had around her this little group of enablers who sort of encouraged her and protected her. And one of them was this slightly creepy uh, unemployed British actor who is her husband, uh, uh, common law husband, and uh, that's me. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> and are you working on something already? For I am writing a screenplay as for the Walt Disney Company. Probably heard of them. And I heard them in tonight's film, mentioned in oh, the yes, same breath right. as Tarantino. Yes, yes. We're, big, we're big Disney fans, my family. I know it's, it's uncool to say, but we really love Disneyland and Disney World. So I'm hoping, I mean, I hope the movie gets made and does well, but really we're looking for some free tickets. Um, so, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> there are all kinds of reasons to make movies, I guess. Uh, Disney, yes, I will tell you one quick, if, if, does anyone here work for Disney? I just have to make sure. But the first time I was ever at Disney for a, a real business meeting, um, Jeffrey Katzenberg was running the studio. It was a, it was a while back. It was 1990-something. And I had a meeting, and we talked about you know, signing a deal there. And I was with my agent, I, which I don't un remember why, because you don't generally go to meetings with your agent. But anyway, the meeting ended, and Jeffrey said, there's somebody outside waiting to go home with you. So I opened the door to his um, office, which was in the animation building. If you've seen Saving Mr. Banks, it's that building. And there was a Mickey Mouse, which we still have at home, that was about this high. And so my agent and I had to carry it out to my car. Yeah. <laughs> and I was driving a Mitsubishi Starion at the time. So it was a pretty small car, and you had to push the front seat 
um, you know, forward to get to the back seat. So we kind of shoved Mickey in to the back seat. And then Jeremy, my agent, went off to get in his car and drive out. And I went to get in my car. And Mitsubishi Stern is not a very nice car. But, uh, I mean, it's fine. But I get in to start driving. And a security guard at Disney comes running over, stops me, and knocks on the window and says, Mickey should ride up front. <laughs> and I, I swear, I'm, not, I'm really not making this up. And, um, <laughs> and I took, I, I pulled him out and we sat together. I can't remember whether I buckled him in or not, but they did not want me driving off the lot with those yellow feet sticking out like a hostage situation. I really, that was, it was an introduction to the, um, their, they, in a great way, they take it very seriously there. Okay. They are um, freaks. I have a, just one Disney studio story. The only time I ever went for a meeting there, uh, because they famously pay so little and are very stingy, the, um, in the main executive block here, I don't know if you know this uh, story, there's the seven dwarves are on oh, the yeah. sort of pediment above the, where the executives go in. And the architect was so underpaid and the builders that they deliberately made the dwarves so that when it rains in LA, they all pee on the executives. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I never thought I'd say this, but now I want to visit Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, if we could raise the lights a little bit. We, we're gonna, we have time for a few questions. I know that some of you have to leave to your parked cars, go quickly and quietly. There's a woman over there, a gentleman here, and a woman in the middle. Yes? There were so many stage actors in the rewrite has Hugh Grant ever thought of appearing on stage in New York? Well, obviously, I would be honored to be asked. Maybe I have been asked once or twice, but um, I, I, I have a slight problem with the stage in that um, I love it, but uh, I get overexcited. And when people laugh at my line, I laugh too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is actually a serious problem. I, I can't keep a straight face on stage. Maybe a drama? Yeah. No, all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Grant, I thought you gave a very good portrayal of Lord Byron in a film that I think was called Racing with the Wind, but I've read that you weren't happy with the film. Were you unhappy with it, and if so, why? It's a question about an early film called Racing with the Wind, where Hugh Grant played Lord Byron. Having read that perhaps you were not happy with the film, he was curious how you felt about it. Well, I'm so impressed that anyone's seen that. You are the first person ever in... <laughs> My life had seen that film. Uh, yeah, it was a, sp a very strange Spanish film. Um, it's not bad. It, in many ways, it's interesting. I'm not entirely happy with my performance. I uh, was playing Byron, who had a club foot. And for some reason, I decided not to have one club foot, but two club feet. <laughs> so I do walk very funny in the film. And I think my perm might have been a mistake. <laughs> OK, <laughs> question there. It's a question about Hugh Grant having always played the guy who gets the woman at the end. Um, would you happily play, would you sign a contract to play a man who doesn't get the woman at the end? Who is the most difficult female? I'm not sure you have to answer that. Who's the most difficult female actor you've worked with? That's not what we usually ask, but certainly the first part of it. <laughs> would I do a film uh, in which I didn't get the girl? Well, I think that would depend entirely on who did get the girl. <laughs> if it was Colin, clearly it would be unthinkable. Um, <laughs> but there are others where it wouldn't matter so much, you know. She maybe just felt for the wrong guy. No, I, I, honestly, that's never, been a, that's never been a criteria. In many ways, I would love to be sent scripts where I don't get the girl, but I don't get them. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you want to say anything about actresses who've been difficult or not? I, uh, well, lots of actresses are very, very difficult, but none are as, quite as difficult as me, I don't think. I'm, okay. I frequently keep actresses waiting while I'm still in my trailer worrying about my hair, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a question for Mark Lawrence? Yes. And then in the back. Mark, from the film, you get the idea when the
a, a question about the balance when you're writing a screenplay, which if we learn from the film correctly is based on the life of the screenwriter, how that is balanced with the actors that you're envisioning to play the role, if that's the case? Um, it, it honestly varies from film to film. Um, sometimes the ones that we've done together, most times, as I said earlier, I've mentioned it to Hugh, and unless he's uh, you know, rejected the idea, I'm writing with him in mind. And when I write for Hugh, it's a, it's a very you know, specific kind of rhythm and, and stuff. But uh, mostly you're writing character. Um, so, you know, something like Miss Congeniality, I didn't think Sandy, you know, I wasn't thinking about any actor um, in particular. So it really varies from film to film. But often what you will do is assemble the dream cast in your head. Uh, that I find is often helpful and gets you through those horrible days when nothing is working on paper. And you think, God, if I could get this right and you could get Alice and Janney. So there's a lot of that kind of thing that goes on. There was a woman in the back, yes. I love the movie Music and Lyrics. Do you have any sto funny stories to share with us about the making of that film? Do you, would you like to go first? No, you go. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it was funny just to force Hugh to do that, um, <laughs> I, I would say, because uh, I think you'd be the first person to say you're not especially, though you have a lovely voice. Um, I, I think you'd probably admit you're not that musical or even all that interested in music. That's absolutely correct. When yeah. you, when on iTunes, they do these things called celebrity playlists. I don't know if you're familiar with them. I've never heard panic in your voice. And when iTunes yeah. called you and asked you to assemble your celebrity playlist and you immediately called me because the only band you knew was the guard, what are the Grenadier? The band of the Grenadier Guards, yes. Military this, 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 marching music. This, 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 <laughs> This is the only music. Which is my sex tape as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you look up Hugh's celebrity playlist, it's actually mine. It's entirely his. Yeah. So, um, so there was that. Uh, music and lyrics was actually, I thought, a surprisingly hard movie to do, um, just because coordinating the music and, and, and everything else. So the, the moment I do remember, if you've seen the movie at the end, there's a big concert sequence and there's a huge Buddha on stage. And we were in Nassau Coliseum shooting for five days. It's, it's Madison Square Garden in the movie, but we actually shot at Nassau Coliseum. And it's one of those things where you have six cameras and cranes and thousands of extras, and there's fireworks going off and songs happening. And we'd storyboarded the whole thing, which is unusual for me to have that level of organization, had it up on boards, you know, so the director of photography and I and the producers could see. And it was clear by the middle of Tuesday we were, and by the middle of Tuesday, we were where we were supposed to be around breakfast on Monday. And when everybody went to lunch, I just went into that big boot and cried. It was the only time I've, <laughs> it was the only time I've actually wept on a set. Um, and, and then um, kind of got my second win, and we came out and just started ripping down things off the story, but we're never getting this, this. It became very much that thing of what do we absolutely have to do and have to tell the story. So there were a million things I wanted to get, but uh, we didn't get. But other than that, it was a fantastic experience because we also had all these great songwriters working on the film. Um, and we got to watch you play. Uh, you actually learned a couple of things on piano. I think yes, you got a couple yes, of chords yes. on guitar. So yes, that was exciting. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, Adam Schlesinger, I think, is the name. That, that's, I looked it up. He wrote some of the songs that you perform, and yeah. I thought they were really quite good. Uh, Adam Schlesinger wrote uh, Way Back Into Love and a bunch of other songs. He's the songwriter in Fountains of Wayne, did that thing you do. Um, Andrew Wyatt wrote Pop Goes My Heart. Um, my son Clyde wrote a song called Dance With Me Tonight. So there was some great songwriting going on in that film. Yeah. Uh, sir. In the same age where so many of the movies are, are violent and have car chases and so forth, I really appreciate Mr. Grant the fact that you and your movies really uh, simplify different parts of relationships and, and, and so refreshing to watch your movies. First, uh, it's so refreshing to watch your movies, Mr. Grant, at a time when so many contemporary films are violent and car chases. They're about relationships. Is there, is there any film about which you feel that you did a great job that you're particularly proud of? Um, uh, well, no, obviously not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if I'm flicking through the channels at night and something comes on that I'm in, I, 
I, I flick off it very, very quickly. Uh, but, well, actually, music and lyrics, I'm, I'm a little bit proud of that because uh, I really do dread music and dancing and anything to do with that. I mean, I remember going to the, I, they gave me a special choreographer. He's a top guy in New York to work out how I was gonna dance on stage and be this 80s pop star. And we were in a big rehearsal room, just him and me in a, in a boom box, or a, you know, music player on the floor. And he said, right, I'm just gonna play the music and I just want you to express yourself and do whatever comes naturally. <laughs> and he pressed the button and I stood there for half an hour. <laughs> And this happened day after day for about a, a week. It was, it was very, a very difficult situation. And in the end, I resorted to drugs and alcohol. <laughs> um, and I did all the singing and dancing in that film uh, on lorazepam, which is delicious, <laughs> and uh, whiskey, which was brought to me in a 7-Up bottle by the makeup girl. Uh, hmm. I'm never sure how seriously to take No, that is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. okay. you, you, you told me on that film that because you know and hang out with Jagger and some other people like that, that you were sort of drawing on that kind of rock and roll persona. We could give it that slant. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just pure terror right. and, and paralysis. Yeah. Well, I, I know that we soon have to wrap up. And uh, please do be aware that this film opens Friday. Tell your friends. And I just want to finish by saying one thing. Um, I, one of my favorite films of yours, I'm going to sort of start answering your question for Hugh Grant, is about a boy. And it, it, you, you play, I mean, a title that is as appropriate to the character you play, who's quite self-absorbed and immature at the beginning, but through the contact with the little boy, uh, Nicholas Howe, I guess it was, you grow. At the beginning, your voiceover says something like, each man is an island. And at the end, your vo voiceover says, but there can be island chains. Yeah. And it seems to me that that sentiment is not unrelated to a film like The Rewrite. And um, in closing, I just want to thank you for giving us a film that really gives us a sense that you not just have to rewrite a script, but sometimes with the help of good people and talent, rewrite a life. Oh, that's thank nice. you that's very nice. much for joining us. Yeah. 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 Yeah.